Good morning and welcome to today's webcast, Strategic Planning for Higher Education. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief housekeeping video. Welcome and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today, we'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. I'm pleased to introduce today's presenters from Moss Adams. Colleen Rosillis, Senior Manager in our Consulting Practice, and Matt Parsons, Senior Manager in our Assurance and Compliance Practice. And with that, I will turn it over to Colleen to get us started. Thanks, Emily. Hi, everyone. I'm Colleen Rosillis. Um, I'm just going to walk you through our agenda today. So we're going to cover kind of why and how we plan and then how we measure our progress toward our strategic plan. I did just want to note we plan to have some time for Q&A, so please do submit questions if you have them as they come up. Here are our learning objectives today. So we're going to talk about the strategic planning process. We'll identify you the key elements of a meaningful strategic plan. Strategic plans can look really different. So we just kind of want to focus on the really core elements that can help you develop your plan. We were, are going to talk about trends and drivers. I did want to note today, so we're in a really rapidly changing environment right now for everyone, especially for higher education institutions. So we're going to talk about that. We'd love your questions about that. We're going to share what we're hearing from our clients as well. And then we're going to talk about key performance indicators and performance dashboards and how they can help us implement our strategic plans. And Emily, it looks like we've got our first polling question. All right, our first poll for today, what type of institution are you? And your options are A, public university or community college, B, private nonprofit college or university, C, private for-profit college, university or trade school, or D, other or a partner supporting a higher education institution. And to participate in our polls today, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And I'll give everyone a few more seconds on this first poll. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Colleen, back to you. 
Great, thank you. All right, so we've got actually a pretty decent mix of public and private here and then some other folks who are supporting. So really looking forward to your questions and comments today. All right, so first we're gonna talk about the strategic planning process. Um, and I am gonna give just a little bit of an overview of the inputs to a plan and really thinking about how does strategic planning fit in our full operating environment. So when we think about starting a strategic plan, we wanna start from a good foundation of all of the data and information we have about our operations already. And so part of that is figuring out what our financial data has been in the past, we should really align our planning with what our forecast looks like. And then thinking about how our planning also can drive the future assumptions in our financial forecast. We also wanna take a look at risk management. Um, we typically don't involve kind of risk functions in strategic planning, but it's really important to look at that information to see really where are our exposures, what are our potential weaknesses as an institution, and where could we potentially work to fill gaps while we look to the future. We gather information from departments and programs, so we look at performance measures, we look at human resources data like succession, turnover, upcoming retirements, things like that. We look at outcomes from programs, operating plans. Strategic plans really don't exist in a vacuum, so we wanna make sure all this information is linked. And it also helps when we try to collect this information to see where it might not exist and where our gaps are, and then we can work to fill it. On the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see inputs that we get from the people side of this. In the higher education especially, you know, our faculty and staff really are our biggest asset. So we wanna make sure that we engage them in the process and that we really get a lot of information from them in terms of kind of where we are, where opportunities are for us to grow and where we wanna go. We also really wanna think about our community. So who are our stakeholders? Who are our partners, our students, our alumni? And then the leadership. So we think about our board, we think about our executive team, and how do we engage them meaningfully in the process to really get a robust plan in place. Strategic planning is a really key part of an effective organization. So we've got four elements on this slide that we like to call the effective, the um, characteristics of effective organizations. Effective organizations do all of these things. I will say, you know, most organizations do kind of two or three really well, and there's always room for growth. So when we think about planning, that's really the first part of this cycle, but it's definitely part of a cycle. So we develop an operating plan or a strategic plan, then we perform, so we execute the plan, and then the people are core to executing the plan. So we wanna reward and recognize people. We also wanna plan for the workforce that we want. So thinking about based on our plan and how we wanna execute it, where might there be gaps in our organization? Where might, might we need to realign? And then what brings this all together is communication. So it's very critical that we communicate what are our goals, how do we plan to achieve them, and how are we gonna reward you for actually achieving them? And this really is a continuous cycle in an effective organization. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Matt to talk about why we wanna plan. Thanks, Colleen. I like this question, why plan? Um, I, I know it sounds like a silly question in today's environment. A uh, better question might be what to plan for or how to prioritize that plan. And we'll definitely get into that. So for now, we know we need to plan because higher education has been the easy target for so many critics. So even if you've historically had a strategic plan, we know that the focus continues to shift and we're left answering questions to every new scandal that develops. Uh, a developed plan, and better yet, a developed methodology will help you stay ahead of the curve, give your board, your staff, and your students confidence in heading into the next emergency. Disruption. So some say this is the buzzword of the year, I'd argue, it's probably been the buzzword of the last decade. Um, it's definitely a little overused, um, and I think before 2020, we often use it in a positive context to describe innovation or transformation. And I think it still very much can be. Um, <clears throat> we've been using it because we know disruption is inevitable, but still when it happens, like has this year, we're often less saying, oh, we didn't see that coming. And that's okay, strategic planning is not about a crystal ball, it's about having an infrastructure in place with workflows mapped out and people slotted into this role so that as a challenge does come up, we have the tools to respond. Uh, I love this quote from William Pollard. He was both a priest and a physicist, and he said, learning and innovation go hand in hand. The arrogance of success is to think that what you did yesterday will be sufficient for tomorrow. 
So in a couple of moments, Colleen will begin to outline the how to plan. Um, this slide just highlights a few of the discussion topics that we know higher education has been tasked to have a plan for um, or answer questions about. And I'd ask that you pick one of these or have another topic in mind as we go through some of the next slides. Colleen, over to you. Thanks, Matt. So in addition to responding to how we uh, think about the external environment and the things that are changing around us, strategic planning can also function as a way to organize ourselves internally and really answering the questions of who are we, what are we doing, and how are we going to do it? And really the key areas to kind of focus us all in one place are around our institution's vision, our mission, and our values. So our vision statement says, where do we want to go? And a vision statement can be really long term. It can never change for an institution. We see lots of institutions maybe revisiting their vision kind of every 10 years and giving it a refresh during that time. Um, a mission statement, that can be just for the duration of your strategic plan. It could be for three to five years. We see in higher ed mission statements tend to be pretty short um, and they tend to last a long time because we are always really focused on, okay, the student experience, you know, providing learning, things like that. So the mission statement doesn't change very often, but it's a good idea to revisit it and really think about, okay, what's the what? What are we doing and what is our purpose here? And then our organizational values. So organizational values, um, it's a little bit squishy. Um, it's really fun to talk about values at the board level and then with your community and kind of see, okay, how do we align? How do we not align? Really the values statements should be reassessed every time that we go through the planning process because things change, the values of our communities change, and the things that we want to respond to change. And what we use the mission, vision, and values for also is a really valuable tool because we're in a limited resource environment of thinking about when we have new initiatives or we want to propose something new that we think about, okay, does this align with our mission? Is it going to get us toward our vision? And does it align with our values? A lot of things can come up, especially at the board level that are pet projects or new exciting innovations that then we'd have to rededicate resources for. And if we ask ourselves those questions and the answers are no to any of those questions, then we shouldn't be doing these things. Right? We really need to focus on achieving our mission and aligning with our values and getting closer to our vision. If we can't do that with these new proposed things, then we should throw them out and really just focus on what's core and important to us. You'll also see on this slide that we have this, these areas divided by who's really responsible for them. Roles and responsibilities are particularly important in higher ed. You know, higher education institutions are really complex. They're highly regulated. Reporting is always changing. Requirements are always changing. And strategic plans can really help us align, okay, where are our roles and responsibilities in each of these levels? Another way that we can look at it is really thinking about governance. Um, governance can be particularly challenging in higher ed, especially when we've got elected boards. Um, really whether or not your board is elected or appointed, all of them come with kind of a constant re-education process about where we want to focus. I think we've all had situations where we've had board members that were either kind of too high level or they were too in the weeds. And so we really love to show this slide to boards during each planning session to really clearly set their roles and responsibilities. So we think about what the board does, which the board decides the what, right? What is our vision? What is our mission and what are priorities? And then management goes off and does the how. Right, so we determine, okay, what are our goals? How are we gonna operationalize the plan? And we try to keep the board really focused on the what, and then we keep the communications about the outcomes up there on the what. I really like this information. This came from um, Nonprofit Quarterly, I think, and it was really, the idea is that boards are should be focusing on the outcomes and priorities and thinking about um, the delegation of responsibilities. So when we think about what the board does, the board is reviewing policy, it's reviewing plans, it's monitoring progress, reviewing the budget, and the implementation is left to the staff side, and really that's what leadership focuses on. And so again, this is kind of the what and the how, and strategic planning can really help focus your board where they should be and really thinking about engaging them in those really high level strategic discussions can make them feel really engaged and valued as well. Emily, we've got another poll question. All right, our second poll 
does your organization have a strategic plan? And your options are A, we have a great strategic plan. B, our plan could be better. C, our plan is being updated or developed. Or D, no, we don't have a current plan. And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE credit for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of the four polling questions. And I'll give everyone about 10 more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Colleen, back to you. All right. Oh my gosh, it's so good to see. We have a great strategic plan as most of the people here, because I think Matt and I will tell you when we have asked this question before, this is typically not the answer that gets the most results. So that's <laughs> really good to hear. Um, also see a lot of plans being updated and developed. So this is pretty interesting. Um, and actually one of the reasons that we thought about doing this webcast is that at the beginning of the year, we started to notice our clients were really talking about strategic planning a lot more than in the past. And we've also seen quite a few RFPs come out um, way more than normal since the beginning of the year really related to strategic planning from higher ed. And so I think this is something that we're all thinking about institutionally as things have changed and as uh, everything is being disrupted, we're thinking about, okay, how do we position ourselves accordingly? So I'm going to talk about now the planning process. And I think that uh, one of the things that we hear most often in higher ed when we talk about planning is someone will say, we have planning fatigue. We have so many different types of plans. We're always having focus groups. We always have task forces. We do a lot of outreach and we just want to settle on something so that we can implement it. So we're going to go through really the keys to success in terms of the planning process and thinking about how can we get you to a plan that we can really focus on implementing instead of just starting over the planning process right after that. I think we've all heard that phrase, so plans are nothing, but planning is everything. We do want to have a meaningful, useful product, and so we're going to focus on two elements here, stakeholder engagement and how we implement and then manage the implementation to make your strategic plan successful. Here's kind of an overview of the planning process. Um, I'm gonna walk through just a couple of the key steps that are really important to the success of the planning process. The first is really sitting down together with your planning team and finalizing your plan for the plan. Um, we often embark on a strategic planning process and thinking about what exactly is our plan, how do we want it to look, what are the steps that we want to take, we kind of skip that part once we convene that first group. And we can get into planning and go off in a lot of different directions as a result of that. And so really sitting down, finalizing your work plan, figuring out who do we want on the team to move this forward, um, making sure that we've got someone who's really a point person who can help to manage it through the process and not get lost in a particular review cycle. Um, a strategic plan can sit on somebody's desk for a long time asking for comments. So we really want to make sure we've got the right people involved. In terms of preparing the plan, I wanted to talk a little bit about conducting the needs assessment. So when we do a strategic plan, we always start by interviewing the core leadership team. That's usually the very first step on the first day. And we just really want to establish a high level needs assessment environmental scan. We ask questions like, tell us about what's working and not working. Where are opportunities for improvement in the organization? Tell us about your staff. Let's talk about what turnover is like. Let's talk about what governance is like. Do you feel like communications are good? What are partnerships like? And really just getting a sense for where we are. And then thinking about what have been challenges in recent years. And when we look forward, where are the challenges that we think we might have? And where are uncertainties? So we know, for example, there are a lot of uncertainties about federal financial aid. There are uncertainties in the regulatory environment. And so we want to dig into them, that. We also then want to spend this time really identifying who do we need to talk to to make sure that we've engaged the right people in the process. And then when we get to the planning phase, so planning sessions themselves, they can be as large or small and as frequent as you want. I will say that uh, in the higher education environment, sometimes the planning process can last 
a whole year and we can have a lot of people involved in every phase of the process. You know, we can have a strategic planning meeting once a month for a year and that could get us to the same result as three strategic planning process meetings over the course of a couple of months. Um, we usually want at least three planning sessions. The first planning session should be a session that is really focused on your mission, vision, and values. And you do want to engage the board in that process, either by collecting information from them in advance so that we can prepare potentially draft mission, vision, and values for them to review or to actually have a planning session with the board at the outset. Then we want to have a planning session focused on goals and strategies. We get the information from our needs assessment, our SWOT analysis, and provide recommended goal areas. There are kind of, um, I would say, a long list of maybe about 15 goal areas that we see across basically every institution. So things like student engagement, financial stability. Um, we also often see campus safety as a goal. Um, I think that we're going to see preparedness and continuity of operations as a goal going forward here. And then we want to get our goal list down probably between three and six. Again, we think about we're in a resource constrained environment. We can't do everything. And when we get to our goals, then we can work with the management team to think about what are the strategies that we that we can take to actually achieve those goals. What does that mean for us? What are the existing tasks that we do and potentially new programs and services that would help us to achieve that goal. It's really critical during this phase to talk about what's cross-functional, what resources are required for this, both in kind of people and dollars and maybe even space. And when we have a really ambitious strategic plan, then we also want to think about what are the potential funding sources for things if we have, for example, um, capital investments as part of our strategic plan. We've seen many of our clients in recent years really thinking about um, making changes to their facilities, so thinking about shifting into additional research, for example, and then what does that mean for our campus on-campus facilities where we would have to retrofit or potentially build new buildings. Um, the cost of real estate and the cost of construction increasing also really impacts how we can actually implement what's in our plan. So really getting into how are we going to achieve this and what are all of the inputs, going back to that input slide that I had earlier, you know, how does this align with our financial forecast, where are our risk exposures, and bringing that all together. And then we always want to have a final session. We love to engage the board at this time to talk about prioritization. And we can get prioritization information from lots and lots of different uh, stakeholders, but thinking about Again, how are we going to make sure that we focus our resources where they belong? In terms of who to include in the planning session, so we see in higher ed, it works pretty effectively to have a cross-discipline committee or task force working on strategic planning. It can be easy in strategic planning to only do it at the leadership level. I think that what we would ask is to consider you taking a more inclusive and broader approach to strategic planning. Um, it can help you to identify people who have leadership potential, who might be at lower levels in the organization, who could be really excited about strategic planning. Um, this could be an opportunity for them to develop some skills and exposure across the institution. It's also a great way to reach out to stakeholders and partners and uh, other groups that you might not regularly get the chance to involve, but that you could help to strengthen your relationship with. The components of the strategic plan are, can be varied for kind of different uh, institutions. I wanted to point out just a couple of important components here. One is thinking about industry best practices. So what does that mean in higher ed? I think that there are a couple of things. So there are leading practices. We can get information from NICUBO. We can get information from our peers. We want to take a step at this point and think about who really are our peers. I think in your mind, as you're thinking about who your peers are, you probably have a list of five to 10 institutions that you could rattle off right away that you might look to to say, okay, what are they doing in terms of policy? What are they doing in terms of student services? We also like to have the conversation 
about who do you match kind of operationally, um, and then aspirational peers. So where do we want to go? Especially if you are thinking about doing some innovation, transforming some of your programs, really thinking about who do we aspire to have as a peer, and then focusing there. And we can get lots and lots of information from other institutions. The best thing to do when we're getting information, especially from our aspirational peers, is to actually reach out and just talk to them. So when we do benchmarking for strategic planning, we do a lot of interviews of who our potential peers are and really talking to them about where do you see where you're going, where are your challenges, and just kind of sharing information. Um, if we anonymize that information and share it out to everyone, they're really likely to participate and it can, can be valuable for all of us. And then I just wanted to talk a little bit about the SWOT analysis. So this is one of those strategic planning buzzwords. It's been around for a long time. I think it really just breaks down to, so your strengths and weaknesses are your internal assessment. What are we good at? What are our opportunities for improvement? Can we capitalize on our strengths? Can our strengths really help push us to the next level? And then what are our vulnerabilities? So areas where we could improve can be anything from our people, our systems, the type of service that we provide, really taking an honest look at that and thinking about can we fill those gaps? What steps do we need to take to operate really more strongly as an institution? I also wanted to note here that uh, we want to think about, okay, where, what are our goals? I would say kind of on a five-year timeline. Longer than five years in higher ed, things change so much that a strategic plan is not necessarily relevant over five years. If you did a longer time frame, I would just suggest building in a check-in maybe every three years to refresh your plan to, to make that work. And you'll see in this slide that we go from kind of long-range inputs over to annual objectives, annual action plans, thinking about how are we actually going to implement this, putting together a plan quarterly, and then measuring our results with metrics, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. So Matt, do you want to talk about the different types of stakeholders in a higher ed institution? Yeah, definitely. So when designing your initiatives versus your goals and versus your strategies, um, it's important to gain input from all those that will be impacted from the plan or will measure it, the plan in some way. Um, and we know in higher education there are so many stakeholders um, from obviously the board, uh, current students, maybe you even have a separate bucket for your prospective students. Uh, you have your donors, your fellow staff, um, and then your faculty, which often have different sets of priorities than your staff um, that might not be so obvious. Uh, your alumni, um, the community where your campus resides, regulators, um, both uh, your accrediting agency as well as those that provide governmental funds like financial aid, research, or other sponsored programs. Um, and then finally, just the general public eye, you know, how you're seen um, from a reputation standpoint. So there's a lot of stakeholders. We can engage these stakeholders in lots of different ways. Um, interviews, I think, are a really great way to engage key stakeholders. And when we have those first meetings with the leadership team, we often ask at the outset, uh, who's going to be upset if they're not consulted for the plan? Like, who is going to see the strategic plan come out and say, I can't believe they didn't tell me? They might not be someone that you necessarily want to include in every discussion on the plan, but it doesn't take very much work to really address those squeaky wheels and get them engaged in a positive way. And they can be a very powerful engagement tool as a result. Also thinking about, do we want to strengthen relationships with anyone? So partners like not-for-profits, the local governments that you're adjacent to, other institutions that you might partner with, sponsors of programs. We also do quite a few focus groups. I think focus groups are really great in higher ed when we think about groups of maybe students, alumni, faculty, and staff, and even members of the local community. Getting a focus group together, especially on a very specific topic, so something like campus safety or the student experience, could be a really valuable for you and is a great way to be inclusive of lots of groups. Um, and I also wanted to note here, you know, because stakeholders are so varied, we also want to think about outreach that captures your entire community, and we may have to get creative. So thinking about meeting the community where they are, um, 
my favorite story about strategic plan engagement is that I once went to a high school basketball game to try to get input on a strategic plan because the community was really into high school sports. And so the idea was, okay, we're going to meet them where they are. We're not going to try to get them to come to us because that can be not as successful. We're really just going to go there and see if we can get input. And we actually got a lot of really great input from the community. So thinking about where does your community gather and how can we solicit information? Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about surveys. I think we do lots and lots of online surveys to get feedback, um, thinking about how we can do that effectively. So surveys are really good for thinking about vision and values at the beginning of a plan. They're also very good for um, thinking about at the end of a plan. So traditionally, a strategic plan, you might hold a couple of open houses, and people might come to you, and you can talk about the plan and present it. Um, you can also do a virtual open house, post a plan online, ask for feedback, have a couple of sessions or pre-recorded information where you talk about why we did the plan and why we made our choices this way and get feedback on what do you think about the plan, what might be missing from it, um, things like that. We also want to consider when we're doing input, and this is really important, we want to take an equity lens at getting input. There are always people who have really great access to who they need to tell. There are people who know how to write a strongly worded letter, letter and it's often that the loudest voices uh, are those who have the most privilege in an entity. And so really thinking about how can we get to those people who are more quiet, people who we don't hear as often, and really get creative and trying to find ways to get input from underrepresented groups. And it looks like we've got another poll question here. All right, our third polling question, who is most important to engage? And your options are A, faculty and staff, B, students, C, board, or D, other stakeholders. And for those of you that would like a copy of today's slide deck, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handout to the right of the slide view. We will also be sending the slides via email after the webcast. I'll give everyone a few more seconds here. And let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. Thank you. Okay, so this is great. So engaging faculty and staff. Yeah, we would agree, right? These are your people who know your institution inside and out. They're your experts thinking about Okay, where do you want to go? What's valuable to you? Where do you see us going? That's really valuable input in the strategic plan. The other part of this is that if our employees aren't engaged in the strategic plan, they're not going to be engaged in implementing it. So the more that we can engage them in the process and get them on board through the process, then that will really help to actually have a successful strategic plan in the end. I think it's kind of interesting here that we have students and board of exactly equal weight. Um, maybe someone can <laughs> write an analytical paper about that going forward. So prioritization. This is a really key element of an effective plan and also a really great way to engage folks by just going through prioritization exercises with your different stakeholder groups. It's also really important to us when we think about as a leadership team and planning. So again, we don't have unlimited resources. We have to focus. That doesn't mean that we might stop doing kind of our ongoing things that are important to keep us going, right? But we do have to focus our efforts, especially on new programs and services or places where we're redirecting resources. So a couple of different ways that we really like to engage people with prioritization. So when we think about point vote allocation, really great if you're having a work session with your board or you're having a focus group to just, you know, put your goals up, put your strategies up, give people sticky dots, let them get up and move around the room and visually see how other people are thinking about what the priorities are and talk about them. Making trade-offs is also a really great way, especially if you have resource constraints or you're concerned about revenues in the future to really have those discussions about trade-offs. Trade-off ranking discussions tend to work best in small groups. So if you can break your planning team up into groups of three or four people, give them a couple of subjects and talk about trading off and ranking and what would we have to give up if we wanted to do this. Those can be really valuable discussions in terms of really getting down to identifying your priorities and really also identifying how you're going to achieve your goal. 
goals. Um, we also love to do a 248 consensus model. Higher ed, we love consensus, right? And so taking that to prioritization and thinking about how can we all agree, um, it's great to get to consensus. We are never going to fully get to consensus across an institution as large and, and varied as um, one of higher education, but doing this process within the planning team can help us to throw out the things that maybe we really all don't agree on or really dig into areas where we need extra work. And then my favorite is budget allocation. Um, so I love to give out a worksheet or do an online survey that says, if you had $1,000 to spend, how would you prioritize it between our goals? Because we work in a world of really large budgets that really are hard for people at the board level. And when we think about even your stakeholders, really hard to understand how our budgets even work, right? They're very complex. And so if we break it down to an amount of money that everyone understands, like $1,000, and say, how would you divide it between our five goal areas that really causes people to think about the reality of our spending decisions and can get to their actual priorities very quickly. And we tend to be able to have really interesting conversations as a result of how folks budget accordingly. And we see it all over the board. So someone will put $1,000 in one. There are people who will divide it totally equally, which is a cop out, but you can do it that way. Um, and then there are uh, people who, you know, really break it down to the the very last. I've seen it broken down into cents before um, because it's just it's hard to have these discussions. But it's such a good way to get feedback, and it's a really easy way to get feedback via a survey too. And once we have our priorities, then we want to develop our plan. Um, this is, uh, you can't read it, which uh, you can't read it because it's an actual client deliverable, but it's a plan on one page. So what's really important to us is that we need the plan to be actually executed. We want it to live. We do not want to go through a strategic planning process and just have the plan sit on a shelf. I think almost everyone has been through a really tough planning process and then seen it not implemented. And it's disappointing and it disengages people. So we love to see a plan just very simply put on a piece of paper, 11 by 17, make it practical. I've been in many organizations where you walk around and you see the plan on one page posted up in folks cubes, you know, in your office so you can refer to it. And then we want to see the plans operationalized. So whenever I give this slide, I always put a boat because I see the strategic plan as really building the boat, but we want to develop operating plans for our departments and our programs and I really on an annual basis to actually sail the boat because we have a strategic plan that's very high level, easy to talk about who we are, where we're going, what our values are, what our goals are, and then we really have to make the rubber hit the road. And so the strategic framework again goes back to, okay, the department Department level, we're going to operationalize this plan and what, what does that mean? So here's a sample operating plan. Um, this is actually from a city government, but I love how simple it is, which is here's who we are. What's our statement of service? How does this connect to the mission? Um, and then our goals. So these should reflect our institutional goals and really feed into exactly where we're going and what we're going to do and then what our objectives are for this year. In the most effective organizations, uh, we see these goals also reflected in individual staff goals and part of performance discussions. And so with the right planning process and the right staff engagement and operating plans, each employee should really understand how they contribute to the ultimate goal and mission of the organization. And it looks like we've got our final poll question here, Emily. All right, thank you. Final poll here. Which of the following areas has been a topic of recent strategy discussion? And your options are A, enrollment or financial health, B, upgrading technology, C, donor relations, or D, regulation compliance. And once you have completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of your CPE certificate from the CPE progress window to the right of the slide view. And just a couple more seconds here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the results. Back to you. 
Thanks, Emily. Yeah, I'm not surprised by enrollment in financial health, especially in today's uh, day and age. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of questions coming up in the um, different conversations and different polling threads over, you know, how are we going to improve enrollment, especially um, with the uncertainty going into the fall uh, semesters, um, and, and then the financial health as well. When we have so many competing trends, which we talked about earlier, um, you know, how do we keep be our boards happy, our faculty's happy, and um, especially the faculty and staff. You know, we know payroll is obviously a significant concern as well. So we'll touch on these in a little bit later. Um, I just want to want to point out one other thing that um, Colleen mentioned earlier. You know, I think it's really important when someone like Colleen comes in and, and does survey results because when we do those initial surveys, um, we notice there's a lot of bias sometimes written in how they're prepared by. Um, the staff that you know want to see certain results and and how they be performed. So I'm um, having a professional come in and help tailor those results is really really key. All right, Colleen, do you want to talk about the next section? Yeah, thanks, Matt. Um, so this is my favorite thing to talk about, which is how do we measure our progress toward our plan? It's really our goal, again, that the plan is alive. And so that means that we want to think about what outcomes do we want to achieve from the plan? How do we measure that? And really institutionalize the reporting of our progress toward the plan. So in many institutions, we'll see an annual strategic plan update, and that strategic plan update, we often talk about what are the activities that we achieved and what are the things we can check off our list. What we actually would want to see are establishing some performance measures that we can report on a quarterly or a semi-annual or annual basis, depending on the type of data, that really shows, okay, here are how we are actually going to quantifiably measure the outcomes we want to achieve in the strategic plan. So when we develop a strategic plan, we always include those enterprise metrics in the plan. We expect regular board reporting as part of institutionalizing. We also love to see departmental metrics established as well. So going back to that annual operating plan that I showed, really showing how are we going to talk about our progress in a meaningful, measurable way. You don't have to have a lot of measures. You know, having just a couple per department can really show how we're moving forward. And then thinking about our individual metrics. So where are we going as an individual? How do we fit into the plan? And how do we fit into how, what we're trying to achieve as an organization? Some really high level performance measures that we see all the time in higher ed. So we can look at just at a program level, what are our program results? What are we trying to achieve and how can we measure that? Development and advancement, really important in higher ed. And we see these a lot. So we look at the return on investment of fundraising. Um, we look at our donor retention, um, what our conversion rate and participation rates are for, for specific groups. Those are kind of core measures. You can measure development and kind of financial functions in lots of different ways. One of the great things about these measures, though, is that you can benchmark them against other institutions, depending on the types of information that they publish. We also see at an operational level, we want to take a look at turnover, and I would also suggest taking a look at retirement eligibility because we have a large bubble of baby boomers who are starting to retire. Um, retirements may also be postponed by the current recession, depending on what happens. And so thinking about what could our future retirements look like and how do we capture that institutional knowledge, we're also seeing increasingly putting together diversity measures, not just for our staff and our student population, but what about our board? And how can we look at diversity in different ways to reflect the population that we serve? I also want to note, there are a lot of people who will push back at performance measures and say, well, uh, you know, I, I am in a finance department. Like, how do we put a performance measure together? There are a couple of core efficiency and effect effectiveness metrics that you can apply universally. So one of them for internal services is your functional cost per the FTE served. So just really basic if we're thinking about a finance department or an, an HR department, what is our cost to operate and who do we serve and what is that cost over time? And then for direct services, you can do exactly the same thing by talking about our cost per the population that you serve. So, you know, nutrition services, you can just take your cost and think about what's the 
student population that you serve and get to a cost that you can look at over time that can help you to identify what's the efficiency and really um, getting into the why behind that. The math's going to talk a little bit about some of the very specific performance measures that he's been seeing um, during the uh, during his current audit season. Thanks, Colleen. Yeah, I would say there's a lot of different resources out there that highlight a number of these program metrics and um, efficiency metrics. Um, I've seen some other schools get um, creative in how they're measuring uh, their performance and, and developing some new uh, ratios as a matter of um, really reporting back to the board and their stakeholders some important information. So, for example, um, when we look at the development side, um, looking at the ratio of alumni student donors and, um, you know, making sure that there's some other form of engagement going on with them. We all know, you know, alumni if engaged can lead to new scholarships, um, which can ease the burden of institutional aid. Um, but I often see alumni relations rank kind of low on the list of other priorities. Um, another one is your capital expenditures as a percentage of tuition. So, you know, we, we looked at reporting number of technology advancements year over year, for example, upgrades to modules like your student information system or, you know, new automations like such as replacing your outdated phone systems. And um, then factoring in that replacement plan for those technologies um, and then budgeting for them um, at the time that you expect to replace them. A couple other areas from a compliance standpoint, just to make sure you have on your list, um, maybe looking at your student withdrawal rates broken down by your degree programs and demographics to help you manage and predict any at-risk students. Um, using your cohort, de cohort default rates as a percentage of tuition revenue as well, I think it's going to be really important. Um, and then as we talked about earlier, satisfaction surveys. So whether that be, you know, IT help desk interactions, um, having surveys come back as results from your campus tours to really understanding how you're engaging, again, those prospective students. Um, and then your use of facilities, you know, are you maintaining them to the degree um, that your students and faculty expect and um, are there trigger areas that you can focus on um, based on some of those results? All right, Colleen, you want to talk about some of the outcome-based budgeting metrics? Yeah. So if you can get truly focused on outcomes, something that can be very powerful for your institution is also looking at your budget through an outcomes lens. So really instead of starting with what was last year's budget and what did we do, but actually thinking about, okay, what do we start, what if we start with next year's goals? And what if we build our budget from that perspective? And there are a number of really interesting tools that are available um, through BoardSource and a couple of different um, other places that you can put together a priority-based budget just as an exercise as a team to think about how might we need to shift resources to actually achieve our goals. We can establish funding targets for our priorities. And then when we submit our budget for approval, we're really thinking about how are we going to achieve our results. And our debate, instead of kind of a traditional budgeting being what to cut, our debate can turn into what to keep. And then that can really easily turn into a performance dashboard. So thinking about what do we want to achieve, where might our challenges be, we're really thinking about how can we achieve our goals, and then we're focusing our board again on that strategic level results conversation, as opposed to our board getting maybe too in the weeds and thinking about operations um, kind of the day to day. Uh, really focusing on, okay, what are our results? How can we shift resources to achieve our goals? And dashboards can be really powerful for that. So performance dashboard can be really simple. It can be complex. It can be homegrown in Excel. It can use more powerful software. It really does not matter how you do it. We have a couple of different examples of what dashboards look like here on this slide. But I just want to note the kind of the, what the best dashboards have. So the best dashboards have an established target. They're, they have on and off track identifiers and they show a trend and they're concise. And I think what's really important to think about in terms of a dashboard being concise, I think we have lots and lots of data that we can show in higher ed. Our institutions are so broad and we have so many different functions, but you are going to put a dashboard in front of a board member and if it's more than two pages, they are just gonna go blank. 
right? Like we really, really want to make this concise and focus on what are the outcomes that we want to achieve. Um, we also really want to know, you want to benchmark yourself against your target and against your own performance. When we establish performance dashboards, really the first thing that we do is we try to look at existing data. So if we think about a measure and we think it's a good one, we go ahead and collect that data maybe for the last three years. We look at the trend line and then we can identify, okay, what could our target potentially be? What direction are we going here? And is this data actually meaningful for us? So the best dashboards have a number of things in common. A couple of things that I want to point out here is that the best dashboards really are not just data. They encourage dialogue. So they encourage you to ask the question of why is this data the way that it is? What about the direction that we're going in? It helps us to identify relationships between different activities. And I also want to note one of the bullets here is about highlighting out of the organ out of the ordinary results. So we really do want to talk about the why here. Um, if you have an out of the ordinary result on your dashboard, highlight it, circle it, figure out a way to bring it to folks' attention and talk about the why. I think that every performance dashboard that comes out next year, for example, it's going to have a COVID blip in it. We're going to see exactly in all of our trend lines when COVID happened and what the impact was. So we want to point that out and talk about it and really think about the impact of that long term. A dashboard can have five measures on it, it can have 25 measures on it, but what's really important is that the data is user-friendly user and we're showing it as a trend over time. We would not recommend your performance dashboard include benchmarking data. We know that boards especially love to know what other institutions are doing. And what we would say to that is you can kind of make benchmarking say whatever you want, depending on who you pick, and that can help you achieve a result. So that might be good for you. But we also want to say the most valuable thing is to really think about what your performance is over time and where you want to go and measure that and be really serious about that. It's good to have information from other institutions, but your performance is the most important. So Matt, do you just want to cover a couple of the resources that we recommend to folks? Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Colleen, for all your experience and expertise in this area. I've seen you do some, you know, really amazing um, work with some of our clients. And um, like you said, there's a lot of great resources that are out there. We've listed just three here for your reference. Uh, we also have a number of tools on our Moss Adams website as well. And with that, I think, uh, Emily, do we have any questions? All right, we do have a couple of questions. Uh, if you have questions for our presenters today, you may submit them in the Q&A window. And let's see here. How about, how long should it take to complete a strategic plan? Yeah, so that's a good question. And I think, um, as I mentioned before, in higher ed, sometimes it feels like we're always planning, right? We can have a two-year planning process if we want. Um, I would say you would not want the strategic planning process to last more than an academic year. So maybe six to nine months maximum, depending on your community engagement and how you want to handle your different planning sessions and engage your stakeholders accordingly. Um, it could be as little as three months if you are really committed to getting it complete. I think three to six months is a really good sweet spot for getting a strategic plan meaningful because then you can really shift to implementation and actually getting the work done. Thank you. And our next question, how often should we redo our strategic plan? Yeah, um, so if a strategic plan has a defined timeline, so if it's a, a three to five year strategic plan, then we absolutely want to look at the strategic plan about a year before it expires. If it doesn't have a defined timeline, then we would suggest taking a look at the plan every three years and just see, does it need a refresh? Do we need to start totally over? Or what can we do differently? Do we need to just add a couple of things in? Have we achieved some of these goals? I don't think that every organization needs to go through a full process every three to five years. But if we have big disruptions in our external environment like we're having now, it's a good idea to just pull that plan down and take a look at it and see how do we need to change our strategy accordingly. Thank you. And let's see, how about what do we do if we are in the middle of a strategic plan and leadership changes? 
Yeah. So this has happened at a couple of my clients. I've had a couple of higher ed institutions who had a strategic plan in process, had a lot of momentum behind it, and then there is a presidential transition. This is certainly not unheard of. Um, and there can be transition on the board during a strategic planning process or transitions in kind of key leadership uh, positions. You know, your, if your provost changes during the strategic planning process and someone comes in new, not only are they learning the environment, but they might have ideas that can totally shift the approach. So what we would recommend is you want to stay the course because while one key position might change, then you still have all of these other folks that you have engaged in the process. You do not want to let it lie and make it seem like you're not moving forward because you can lose their engagement and interest and ultimately lose their interest in implementing the plan. So you want to keep moving it forward. I would suggest whoever in that leadership role who is new, you want to bring them on uh, and bring them up to speed. So have an, another planning session that's really just here's the information that we've collected so far, here's where we are in the process, and here's where we think we're going. And then what we often see when there's a leadership transition during a strategic plan is we finish the plan, and then maybe we update the plan 18 months two years into that person's tenure as they have gotten more familiar they're fully onboarded they understand how the institution works and they might have some things they want to implement but really doing those right at the very beginning can actually be a little bit harmful to making the plan successful yeah i was just going to add i mean having a really well documented management tool like you've shared and some other um, uh, key metrics and, and tools in your in place documented can really bring those people on board and make them buy into the plan and then make them realize the you know how how well thought out everything is and then to develop their future um, thoughts into the next strategic planning session great thank you and that looks like all we have for questions um, if you think of another question you may reach out directly to colleen or matt and thank you, Colleen and Matt, for a great presentation today. As a reminder, if you attended today's presentation in a group and would like to receive CPE credit, you must complete the group attendance sheet found in the slide deck and handouts window to the right of the slide view. If you participated as an individual and met all certification requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I'll keep the webcast console open for a few minutes to give you time to download your CPE certificate. A copy will be emailed within three weeks should you have any difficulty downloading it now. Here is a link to an online survey where you can provide feedback for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete the survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining us and we hope you'll join us again next